I'm Clark McLeod of Monarch Research. The presentation you're about to hear is not only entertaining, but will change the lives of many people who experience it. Did for me and all of us at Monarch Research. I want to introduce Dr. Doug Tallamy to the thousands of Lynn County residents who are planting native trees this season through our Planting Forward program. Dr. Tallamy is a professor at the University of Delaware in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology. Our friend and mentor, Dr. Tallamy. Thank you very much, Clark. Uh, before I start, I want, to, I want to put what I'm going to talk about into what I call ecological context. Of course, you all know that uh, a year ago in August, you suffered one of the worst natural disasters on record, that, that uh, terrible derecho that went blowing through eastern Iowa, Iowa lost 775,000 trees uh, in Lynn and Benton counties. Uh, well, the Monarch Research uh, Project was perfectly positioned to respond to this, and they respond they did with one of the greatest community restoration projects I have ever seen. Uh, the very first year, they got six companies involved to, to uh, get plants in the ground. This year alone, 2021, 26,000 free trees to uh, Eastern Iowans. Um, so what I want to do today is tell you why that is such an important effort, why we need these trees, why we need the animals these trees support, why it's not just any old tree that will work, it's got to be the right trees, and finally, we'll talk about what your role as a citizen of Eastern Iowa is in this, this great restoration project. But before we do that, I wanna to return to something that happened in uh, the Eastern US anyway. In 2019, we had what we call uh, an oak mast. Members of the Red Oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head capsule, forced its head through there, there's my little pointer, and then it forced its entire body through the, the hole. It was a tight squeeze, kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it, it uh, escaped, plopped down, very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming below the surface of the soil in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa and then stays there for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are at the base of that extension. They take those mouth parts, they chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in it, and that's how the larva gets into the acorn. Well, you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year? Uh, well, it's because red oak acorns take 18 months to complete their development. And if the weevils came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they have left the acorn, that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants uh, that live, the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils once they leave the acorn. And if scouts find a new uh, empty acorn, they get very excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it is time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, the entire colony moves into the new uh, a new acorn in about 30 minutes. And they post a guard at the entrance to that hole, make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they will live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point? It's very simple. That is simply one of, of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and, and acorns, jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of, of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn and fly up to a mile from the parent tree. Then they tap that acorn beneath the, the surface of the soil. And the object, of course, is they're gonna go back and get it in the wintertime and have something to eat. Uh, well, Jays' memory's uh, not, not all that good. It reminds me of my own memory. 
For every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one of them is in the winter time, which means for every four acorns they bury, they're planting three uh, new oak trees. And they can bury up to 4,500 acorns per day each fall. So that's how oaks move around. You won't have the Bonita Sphinx moth unless you have the evening, evening primrose uh, on the prairies. This is one of the rare sphinxes on our prairies, very specialized relationships. Um, you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants because that's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the large trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have this plant, Facilia. That is the only pollen that, that particular bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. So without those plants, you don't have the bees. There are at least 13 species of bees in, in Iowa that can only reproduce in the pollen of, of uh, perennial sunflowers, for example. You won't have the, the uh, Baltimore checker spot without white turtle head. I could talk all day long about nature specialized relationships. Point is though, that today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, stood on the edge, looked out over its, its wonderful view, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Of course, we can't leave it as it, as it was because we haven't. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we've logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it, we have drained it, we've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the US, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved, carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done this? I don't know. Uh, I suppose we thought the earth, our nest was, was so big that we could foul it forever and, and there wouldn't be any consequences. But we were seriously wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. Followed by this one. The UN now, now uh, predicts that we're going to lose a million species to extinction, so permanently gone, probably in the next 20 years. And I love the way they report headlines like this, as if it's just another headline. They might as well say, well, we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline. This is not an option, folks. It is not an option to watch the life around us disappear. Well, I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses. That's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from, from uh, a number of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this, this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, the great E.O. Wilson, greatest entomologist probably of all times, Harvard Emeritus at this point, told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects on planet Earth. And he did it in this paper back in 1987, The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi to do that. And of course, humans would not survive any of those, those uh, drastic changes. 
there is some good news here, and that is that that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature itself. But we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember that, that humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on it. We're totally dependent on the products of healthy ecosystems. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that, that plants do. You know, the ecosystem services are not just for humans. They're for everything out there. Plants are producing oxygen. They're cleaning water, slowing its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use, capturing carbon, enormously important today, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, using the carbon uh, molecule in order to build their tissues, but then they also pump extra carbon into the ground. Our soil scientists now tell us that the, the soil around us can sequester up to seven times the total amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere right now. We just have to get it into the ground, and that's what plants do. Plants also build topsoil, hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they convert sunlight into food. If we didn't have plants, we'd have to eat sunlight without them, and that'd be, that'd be tough. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of, of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is it's just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today when we need more, just humans alone need more ecosystem services than ever before because we have 7.8, 7.9 billion humans on the planet. Taking huge areas of the planet out of production is, is just not a good idea. Now there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most uh, eloquent, wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is that the oldest task in human history is to live on a piece of land without spoiling. And there have been indigenous groups that have been good at doing that for long periods. But uh, by and large, our, our huge Western societies, our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually uh, take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely ruining an area, then going to another area doing the same thing. Clearly not sustainable behavior. So Allah had a dream. He dreamt that we humans were actually capable of, of uh, developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed that we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems everywhere we went. And that's what he called a land ethic, wrote about it in the same county almanac. What he did not talk about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in the culture of Adel Leopold's day. It's still embedded in our own culture that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I want to argue today is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked almost exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to save nature where there are a lot of people. And by save nature, I'm actually talking about reconstructing it where we've already dismantled it. We have to do that where there are a lot of people because that's almost everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not just hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Let's go back to private property. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, and that includes uh, ag land, by the way, we're gonna fail because we'll be working in areas that are too small and too isolated uh, and too few uh, in order to conserve the amount of nature that we need to run the ecosystems we all depend on. There are some uh, low-hanging fruit uh, uh, options available to us, though, that we, we uh, really need to start taking advantage of. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? So we've got 21 million acres in those types of landscapes. You know, Rhode Island is 1.5 million acres, so um, that's a lot of land in, just in, in pipeline rights of ways. Railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. The Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big places. 
roadsides, another 17 million acres. Then we have all the places where we live, both in rural areas and suburbia in our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in, in those landscapes. If you add up just these areas, and, and we could uh, think of other areas to include, that's 599 million acres that we could be doing a whole lot better job of conservation on. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, plus Oklahoma, Montana, California, even throw Texas in there. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do conservation almost anywhere. Now, when I use the word conservation, um, I, I don't mean uh, we're just going to conserve what's not already destroyed. We do need to do that, but we need to actually restore what we have destroyed. And before you tell me we'll never put it back the way it was before we destroyed it, um, I, I get that. I, that's probably true. It won't be exactly the same. But we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions between animals and plants to, to create functional ecosystems again, even if they're not exactly what, they, what was there before we humans came around. In order to rebuild an ecosystem, uh, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute equally to ecosystem function. So we have to start with, with the most important groups. And there are two groups we can't do without. One would be the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. Uh, these plants are capturing most of the energy from the sun and turning it into food, which they then store in their tissues, mostly in their, their leaves. Okay, now we have the energy from the sun as food in the leaves of plants. Well, if you don't move that energy from plants to animals, then you don't have any animals and you don't have a functional ecosystem. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat invertebrates that eat plants. Most of those invertebrates are insects, and most of the insects that are passing energy onto other animals are in fact caterpillars. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So when we're reconstructing ecosystems, if they don't include a lot of caterpillars, there will be failed food webs and you won't have, you won't have succeeded. I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, it's almost the same bird as the black cap chickadee. That's what you have in, in Iowa. Um, they're, of course, the birds that are at our feeders in the wintertime. And a lot of people think, well, all they need is seed. That's half of what they need in the wintertime. The other half is insects. But when they are reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. So your feeder doesn't help them at all. They switch entirely to insects. And if they are in a healthy environment, they will rear their young entirely on caterpillars. And it turns out chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of, of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Uh, there are a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that um, one of my students, Ashley Kennedy, did uh, a few years ago. She put out a call to um, bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season uh, and, and send those pictures to her so that she could identify the prey items that were in the beaks of the birds when they were carrying food to the nest. The object was to reconstruct the nestling diet of as many bird species in North America as possible based on these pictures. You're looking at a summary of, of her data where she had enough um, pictures from different uh, bird families. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet in each one of these bird families that was caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of, of these reconstructed ecosystems. Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So something special about caterpillars, let's talk briefly about what it might be. There's actually several things special about caterpillars that are at least important to birds. And one of them is that caterpillars are soft. Think of this guy as if he is a uh, little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is cuticle, it's exoskeleton, it's made of chitin, it's undigestible, and the birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring the, the esophagus. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, they're pretty rough. They take that beak and they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also pretty large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? 
They are nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, have a low percentage of, of chitin compared to uh, most other insects, particularly compared to, to beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. Uh, and a lot of beetles have very sharp edges as well. And finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for, for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I, I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate, and birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants, and we have to get them from plants because they are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure that I have lots of carrots to get my beta carotene and lots of tomatoes to get my lycopene and lots of whatever that is to get my lutein. And when I eat those things, they stimulate my immune system. And I cannot think of a better time to have a strong immune system. Carotenoids are, are antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this male prothonotary warbler here, who is bright yellow because he's had access to lutein's. And he takes those lutein's and he makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Where is he getting his carotenoids from? Well, from what he eats, of course, but carotenoid content is not equal among invertebrate prey items. So these first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other, or other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. Far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars eating the green leaves where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and, and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets, they're essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two uh, a day enough? It's a good question. Let's go back to chickadees. We've got a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around, so nobody's been able to count those. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to get a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird, to independence. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do because in so many places, that's all we have is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not include all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set from Rosenberg et al. That's the group that said we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the ones that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, uh, and the bird species that don't require insects. So things like the, the finches and doves that can actually reproduce on seeds. Well, the finches and doves and the seed eaters did not lose any numbers in the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects that depend on them lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This does not prove cause and effect, uh, but it certainly is suggestive that when you take away bird food, the birds disappear. Not rocket science. So if we want birds in our life, if we want all the things that eat insects that I'm not talking about, and we do because that's what runs our ecosystems. We have to start landscaping in a way that creates these insects, that supports them. It's a different goal for, for our landscapes. In the past, we have landscaped with, with aesthetics in mind alone. You had to have a pretty landscape and whether it was totally dead, that didn't matter. Well, we have to turn that around. Now we want pretty landscapes that are living uh, landscapes. How do we do that? How do we add caterpillars to our landscapes? We do that by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. Seems easy enough, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we choose. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. 
and the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all the boxwood and all the calorie pear and, and all the burning bush, all of those Asian ornamentals that we typically landscape with in your yard and you won't make any new monarch butterflies because the only thing that makes a new monarch butterfly is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun, use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. Not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are highly specialized on particular plants. Every single plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two that are, are uh, very similar in how they defend themselves. And they develop the adaptations necessary to circumvent those particular defenses. They develop the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. Uh, but it takes a long period of, of interacting with that particular plant for all these adaptations to fall into place. And when they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. And that's why when you take milkweed out of your yard, they're not going to start eating your crepe myrtle or your grass or anything else. They can't do it. So what's their alternative? They disappear. And that's exactly what we've seen with, with the monarch. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild ecosystems, we can't do it without having the, the organisms within that ecosystem that run that ecosystem, which means you need a functional food web and only particular plants will create that food web. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well that works when you do choose the right plants. So I'm gonna start with, with uh, uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. It's where my wife, Cindy and I live. This is what it looked like when we moved in. Uh, it was part of a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots and we got one of them. Very old farm had been farmed for uh, 300 years almost. And the last thing they did was to, to mow it for hay. So there were very few plants there. The goal of course was to restore the biodiversity on this little piece of, of Eastern Pennsylvania. In order to do that, we had to put in the plants that support the caterpillars that run those, those food webs. And here are just some examples of, of how that worked. I wanted to see if I could attract a Canadian owlet to our yard. That's what a Canadian owlet looks like. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet before I tried this. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you don't have Canadian owlets unless you have meadow rue. It's the only plant they eat, host plant specialization. And there was no meta roux on our property, no meta roux anywhere around us. The whole area was farmed to death for, for hundreds of years. So I got some meta roux seeds from someplace and planted them. They grew very nicely, but it was not a big patch of meta roux. And I, I really had my doubts about whether Canadian outlets would ever be able to find my meta roux. So I didn't even go out and check it. It was about a month and a half, two months before I finally walked by for another reason. And notice it was covered with Canadian owlets. They had found the meadow roux right away. I'm still surprised about that. Um, so now we have a good population of meadow roux and Canadian owlets. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. Um, this beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there was some ditch daisy about 14 miles away in a, in a power line cut. So I got some seeds, planted them. It's an annual, it grew very nicely. Well, it took a full year for the, the moth to actually find our, our patch of Bidens, but they did. And now we've got a good population of both the goldenrod stowaway and ditch daisy. So we've added four species to the property. Same story with the hackberry emperor. Um, we didn't have any hackberry emperor. 
And I wanted it not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs there. It's a species that should be there. But as its name suggests, it requires hackberry, and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry celtus. Walked by one of my, my hackberry uh, trees, looked at one branch in June. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So another big success. And now we've added six species to the property. And that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. But along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, curiously enough, the goldenrod flower moth. I'm not sure why it hasn't found our goldenrod, but um, that's what the caterpillars look like. This is part of the fun. I mean, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I, I go out and look for the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I'm going to find it, and that'll be a great day. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. A lot of people don't like it. I don't know why. It's a great native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's got good fall color, makes nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. It's a great pollinator plant, believe it or not. The flowers are, are uh, inconspicuous to humans, but the native bees love them. Uh, and it is one of the major host plants for uh, the big sphinx moths that uh, particularly cardinals really like to rear their young on. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Wanted to see if I could get the double tooth prominent at, at our house. It's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Um, I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you've got to love this guy. Well, we didn't have any uh, American elms. We didn't have any elms at all, but there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die from the blight. So I got some got some seeds from them, planted them. Um, it's been 19 years since I planted them. Those trees are 80 feet tall at this point. They, uh, they were a huge success and the caterpillar came right away. American elm. Wanted to see if I get the evening primrose moth uh, because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, we didn't have any evening primrose, enothera, believe it or not. So I planted that. Moth came. It spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, those are just examples of the, the, uh, some of the plant lineages I put on our property. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. It's enormous. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. You know, when I hear people say, well, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oaks when it's, they're 400 years old, you're right. You won't. But if you can enjoy what your oaks are doing, particularly for your local food web, you can enjoy them the very first year. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they're free, by the way. And immediately they started to attract the moths that run the food web at our house. By bringing in things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the Suzuki's promolactus, the uh, red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the street dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bugalatrix, the orange patch, patched smoky moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a crocus geometer, a moth standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. So they start to contribute to your food web, food web immediately. This is what our house looks like today. We have a little traditional lawn here, but we put a lot of plants back. I'm still adding species that should be there. But about four years ago, I made the, the decision to try to uh, take a picture of every species of moth that occurred on our property. I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,128 species of moths that I have photographed so far. They're now making a living uh, at our house. And we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240,000th of the land area, uh, we have 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And we have them because we put the plants that they depend on back. 
And because so many of these species are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we saw last year. The World Wildlife Fund says that uh, the Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house. I am sure we have created uh, or, or yeah, created. We put the plants back. We created uh, more than two thirds of, of the biodiversity that used to be there. Uh, and we did it simply by, by putting the plants back. And it didn't take that long either. So my point here is that these are, these are frightening, terrible headlines. And people tend to throw up their hands and say, well, that's it. It's done. It is not done. We can turn it around by putting the right plants back. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Will it work on smaller properties? Most people have, have smaller properties. Um, and that's a good question. Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri to try to answer that question. They have 0.6 acres, uh, 18 times less land than, than Cindy and I have. Uh, and they're in the middle of a, a typical development. Their neighbors all have the big lawns. Uh, and the non-native ornamental plants. Well, the first thing that, that uh, the Terpstris did was get rid of the big invasive species that was choking their property. And that was uh, Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. Uh, and they replaced uh, that, that invasive species with a lot of native species. And they also put in a little, little uh, what they call a bubbler, a little water feature for the birds. And then they sat back and started to count the bird species that were using their 0.6 acres. And they are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, right on the other side of this wall uh, is one of the runways for O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one tenth of an acre that is three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. Uh, and it's totally isolated. It's not connected to any natural area at all. It's a pretty one-tenth of an acre, but it's, it's an island. She did the same thing though. She got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, water feature for the birds. And then she sat back and started to count her, her birds and she's up to 120 species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there are four things that we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. Uh, and we do want to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to shrink the area that we have in lawn. We have more than 40 million acres uh, nationwide in lawn. And that's a 2005 statistic. So you know it's a lot more than that. That's a statistic that was created before so much of the Midwest converted it, the weedy edges of, of agriculture into lawn. So, uh, and, and you know, that's an area bigger than, than New England that is in an ecological deadscape. So uh, we know why we do this. We, it's a status symbol and we like status symbols. We need status symbols. And I'm not suggesting we get rid of lawn, but I am suggesting we cut the area of lawn in half. And if we do that, if we replant half the area of lawn, the area we keep can still be manicured, we can still be good citizens, but we can replant 20 million acres. And if we do this at home, we can create a new national park that we call Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonland, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, bless the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Out of all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. Homegrown National Park would be the biggest park in the country. What do you get when you put a piece of nature right where you live? You get the opportunity to interact with nature, to build a personal relationship with the natural world at your own pace, your own time. All you have to do is go outside. You can do it by avoiding crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, they're wonderful places, but there are millions of people there. So that's really what you're interacting with is other people. It's free. There is, is no uh, admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the, the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. And I don't know how you can develop that personal relationship with nature unless you are alone. 
It's not mediated by some, somebody else. This is particularly important for our kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Lube. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher, they drive for an hour, go to a natural place, walk around for an hour, teacher tells them not to touch anything. And they get back on the bus and they go home and that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If there's some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside alone, no parental supervision, let them work it out on their own. Why is that so important? Because they need that, that personal relationship with the natural world, because they are going to be the future stewards of the planet. If they don't know what they're stewarding, why they're stewarding it, and if they don't love stewarding it, they're gonna be lousy stewards. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii in a very modest patch of nature. It's, it's a little patch of lawn with a hedge. But there are no lizards that live there. And she discovered that and sent me this picture uh, to describe how you hunt uh, an old lizard. You get in the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. And you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put it in an aquarium. You learn how to take care of it. Learn how to be a good steward of the natural world. And there's your personal relationship. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be, be crawling on the ground in her best dress, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture not long ago, so who knows. But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet. If you want your kids to do more than, than catch lizards, get Nancy Strinisty's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples have how to expose your kids to, to nature right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, this is the perfect time to do it. You're restoring Eastern Iowa. You're, you're converting uh, probably an awful lot of lawn into natural areas by putting the trees that, that Clark is offering you back. Go to homegrownnationalpark.org and put in your data. What you do is you, you uh, put in your location, the amount of area that you're, you're converting to native plants. Uh, and you, your little firefly will, will light up on, on the map. And what you're going to see is all the other people that have done this. Uh, the object, of course, is to get our 20 million acres worth of, worth of uh, habitat converted from lawn. It's our attempt at social media to uh, call to action, particularly for people who don't realize that where they live is a really important part of the future of conservation. Uh, we can see it happening, uh, you know, visual uh, effect here. So far, I've got 9,700 people on, on the map, so I hope you, you consider joining as well. Doesn't cost you a thing, and no, we're not using your data. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put in the area that used to be lawn? Some of them, at least, have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. So remember what a keystone is. Here's the Roman arch. A keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out, the arch collapses. Uh, well, it turns out that, that there are just a few plants, few of our native plants that are doing most of the work. They're the keystones. If we take them out of our food webs, the food webs collapse. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those, those food webs. So think of the keystone plants uh, where you live as the, the two by fours in the ecological house that you're building. They're essential. The house will fall down without them. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. But they're not the only thing in your house. You're not done building your house when you have your, your keystone plants. It's just that they're, they're critically important. So the question no, is no longer simply are natives better than non-natives. On average, they certainly are. But there are a lot of natives that aren't contributing all that much either. So the question really is, do we want the most important species in terms of supporting our caterpillars and our pollinators or not? I get an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know that, that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America about 7 million years ago? That makes them native. Uh, that means we can plant them and everything will be great. Well, yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not our metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not, whether they're productive. 
I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago, they produce zero species of caterpillars. So they're there, they're taking up space, but they're not contributing to your local food web. That's what I mean when I say not all trees are equal. Some are really important. And what's the most important tree in, in the nation? It's one of the oaks, the genus Quercus. In 84% of the counties in which they occur, they are the number one keystone plant in terms of supporting caterpillars. 275 species of caterpillars in Lynn County alone, which is 20% of all the caterpillars that occur in the entire state of, of Iowa on that single type of plant, oaks. Oaks support over 950 species nationwide. There is no other plant you can put in your yard that is going to do more for your local food web. And no other plant genus comes close to that. Here's an example of what keystone oaks are doing in, in our yard in Pennsylvania. Now, so far I've recorded 1,128 moth species. Of those 1,128 species, 981 have known host plants. So there's more than 100, I don't know what they're eating. Out of the 981 species, 287 use oaks. And we've got 69 genera of native woody plants in our property, only one of which is the genus Quercus. We've got hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity, yet they're supporting 29% of our moss species diversity. That's how powerful a keystone plant is in your yard. Imagine what would happen if we took oaks and other keystone plants out of the system. Diversity would crash. So how do you find out what the keystone plants are for, for uh, your county? Uh, anywhere in the country, you go to National Wildlife Federation website, Native Plant Finder, and put in your zip code and the rank list of both woody and herbaceous plants will pop up for your county. So this is what a typical list looks like, um, particularly for Eastern Iowa. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows, native elms. It's because if you go to the nursery and say, I want an elm, they could sell you a Siberian elm. If I, you know, I want a willow, they'll sell you a weeping willow from Turkey. I want a cherry, they'll sell you an ornamental cherry from, from Asia. You've got to specify that you want a native member of these particular genera, because if you get a non-native member, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. We've already measured that. These are the most important herbaceous genera um, in terms of supporting caterpillars, but they're also the most important in terms of supporting specialist bees. When you're trying to build a, a pollinator garden, you want to, to support the bees, uh, the specialist bees that require particular plants, because the generalists will use those plants as well. And goldenrods, the, the genera that asters were broken up into, and, and sunflowers alone support more than 40 species of, of specialist bees. So if you have these, these plants in your yard, you've got the potential of supporting those 40 species. If you don't, they won't be there. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which of course is not the goal. There's a lot of research coming out now, which is demonstrating very, very uh, conclusively that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines. These are all the ways that, that uh, lights kill insects. This is actually good news, at least, at least to me. We have got to turn around insect declines. We have already lost 45% of the insects on the planet. Remember, they're the things that are keeping us, keeping us happy here. Can't afford to do that. So we've got to turn that around. If we can do that by flicking a switch at night, that's pretty easy. We're getting off, getting off easy. But I know what you're going to say. I cannot turn that light out over my garage because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to recognize is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is the best because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to particularly night flying moths. If we were to switch out our, our uh, white bulbs for yellow bulbs in our security lights, overnight we would save billions of insects and billions of dollars too because the LEDs, of course, are a lot more energy efficient. Okay, there are, are uh, the fourth thing we need to do in order to uh, help those caterpillars that are running our food webs is to landscape in a way that allows them to complete their development. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete the development on the tree. 
Uh, the caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from a branch, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 94% of them, and this isn't just for oaks, this is for the caterpillars that develop on trees in general. 94% drop from the tree after they finish growing and they wiggle their way beneath the ground, pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And you know that we landscape like this everywhere. Um, we, don't, we don't tolerate it. We, and plus we mow and, and compact the soil to the point where the soil is so, so compact that the caterpillars can't get underground to pupate. So the way we landscape becomes an ecological trap. We call in caterpillars or we call in the adults, the moths, they lay their eggs and the caterpillars develop and then they drop down and then they die. I am convinced that this is another major cause of insect declines, but it's easily reversible. And by the way, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option. It's what most people do. You have a big tree in a yard. We're just starting to measure uh, how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they will do better in a situation like this, where you have a tree, then you have a layered landscape. Maybe a dogwood here, a, a native azalea, ferns, ground cover. This is a safe site. The caterpillars drop down. The soil is not compacted. They can pupate. They can spin their cocoon. They're not going to be mowed. They're not going to be trampled. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink your lawn. You put plants around your trees, not lawn, and it becomes a safe site for those caterpillars. This is where you can use your, your native ground covers uh, liberally, like uh, wild ginger. There's native pachysandra. There's foam flower, the may apples, ferns. This is a, uh, a hotel in Athens, Georgia. Those are red maple trees. Any caterpillar developing on those trees will drop down into this fern bank and be able to complete their development, even though it's the middle of a city. So we can do a whole lot better in terms of promoting caterpillar well-being by thinking about the way we, we landscape underneath our trees. And there is also room for compromise in our plant choice. We're learning this from uh, the results of a study by another grad student, Desiree Narango, who worked with chickadees in the suburbs of, of Washington, D.C. Her question was, how well are chickadee populations sustained in landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by non-native introduced plants? The first thing she found is that when, when these suburban landscapes were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, there's 75% less bird food. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So their nest box is up in every, everybody's yard, but uh, chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to breed. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive. Uh, if they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to reach maturity. And if you put all that information into a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of woody non-native plant biomass in your yard, from none to 100%. And we focus on, on non-native plant biomass, woody plant biomass, because that's where chickadees forage. All right, this dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you're reproducing at this rate, uh, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you're above the dotted line here and you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, uh, then you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap, which is around 30%. So uh, being very generous, you can have up to 30% of your non-native, of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. As long as 70% is native producing all those caterpillars that the chickadees need. Uh, so this is important because this is the area of compromise. If my message was you can't have any non-native plants, very few people would listen because we, we love our, our native or non-native plants. But remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. Get these native plants back into the landscape and the food webs will be sustainable. Can municipalities help us live, live with nature? You know, not everybody has a great organization like, like uh, the, the Monarch Project. So um, 
It's an important question. And yes, the answer, the answer is yes, Minnesota has, has shown us that uh, they've you know, very successful lawn conversion programs. They call this lawn to, to legume, where the state helps homeowners convert uh, some or all of their property uh, to the appropriate uh, prairie plants that you'd find in Minnesota. Very popular, popular program. Pennsylvania has just started a lawn conversion program. You get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your lawn to uh, native plants. This was created to help watersheds, but it's a perfect example where helping watersheds also helps the biodiversity within those, those watersheds if you choose the right plants. There's an island off Florida where uh, the, the, they're paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it. Everybody would want one. Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas have, have uh, uh, bounties on calorie pears, Bradford pears. Take down a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. And even uh, public utilities are getting into the act, particularly in the West. San Antonio water systems giving people $100 coupons to plant uh, water efficient native, native plants. And of course, the great lawn conversion programs in California, up to $2 per square foot rebate by getting rid of the, the lawn that they do not have the water for and replacing it with appropriate xeric plantings. You know, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And somehow uh, the first one is that we've come to think that nature's optional. We like it. Uh, it's nice to have around, but it's not essential. It's not necessary. And that means, of course, when, when resources are in short supply, when push comes to shove, which is always, nature takes a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there saying, we're going to save wildlife for future generations. And the implication is to for have future generations to enjoy the wildlife. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. Save these places so the future generations can enjoy them. And I get that, but that suggests nature's there just for entertainment. No wonder we don't think it's, it's necessary. It's much more important than that. Nature, it, we need nature so that we have future generations, a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about this, but by restricting conservation efforts just to areas where we don't have a lot of humans, we've condemned them to, to failure because those areas are too few, too small, uh, and too isolated. David Quammen has a, an excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this, of course, is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance. Even our yards, even our corporate landscapes, even our roadsides, even, even Cedar Rapids where all the trees have been knocked down. We've got to put these things back. We need to glue our rug back together again by putting the appropriate plants back. Not just to make biological carters that connect viable habitats with each other, but to create viable habitats where they no longer exist. For the first time in modern history, humans are going to start to coexist with nature. Our third misstep was to, to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. Somehow we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, the Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We have been excellent at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. Right now, so many of us feel powerless. The earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? 
Well, one person can shrink their lawn, one person can use keystone plants, one person can remove the invasive species on their property. We didn't have a time, chance to talk about that. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can totally revitalize the property that, that he or she owns. And it shrinks the, prop, the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problem. Just worry about your little piece of the uh, planet that you can, you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you're going to start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded, all understaffed. They'll love you as a volunteer. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. And we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and ultimately our own. So I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.